Welcome to chapter four. This is on autonomic drugs. Autonomic drugs are really important in dentistry because we use some of these drugs. So for example, when we're doing local, local anesthetic, so let's say some, a client comes in and um, when we're cleaning their teeth, when we're depriding their teeth, they're very um, sensitive, for example, their teeth are very sensitive, then what we may do is we would may um, ask the dentist to come and apply local anesthetic and numb the area. And one of the ingredients in local anesthetic is uh, is basically an autonomic drug, which is what we'll learn about. Okay, so in dentistry, we do use autonomic drugs, which we'll talk about. We use them in local anesthetic to numb teeth. We may see clients using these drugs, and one of the side effects of these drugs is xerostomia or dry mouth, which we'll talk about. Okay, so these are drugs that we do see in dentistry. Now, I want to review the um, autonomic nervous system. You may remember from anatomy class where you learned about the, the um, nervous system and how it's broken down into two sections or into two parts, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So I'm just going to quickly recap what that is about. Let's just say you are um, being chased by a bear or actually this guy over here is being chased by a bear. When he is being chased by a bear and he's running for his life, he's fighting for his life, what we say is what he's doing right now is fight or flight. He's either going to fight the bear or he's going to run away. He's going to fly. He's going to run away. Now, when he's doing that, when he's fighting the bear or when he's running from the bear, all of these things will be happening to him. So let's look at some of the, the stuff. Eyes, dilates pupil. His eye is going to um, become bigger. And that's what we see here, right? See how his eye is bigger? When you're running away from something that's so life-threatening that you're terrified of, your eyes will get bigger. Dilate basically means bigger. Inhibit saliva production. If you're running away from something, your mouth is automatically going to get dry. You're not going to produce any saliva. And that's typically what happens when you're scared. Dilates the bronch, so the lungs. When you're running, for example, you'll need air, right? You're going to be huffing and puffing. You're going to need more and more air so that you can run a longer distance. So what happens to your lung is it gets um, bigger. It expands. It dilates. It becomes bigger so that there is more oxygen that can flow in the lungs so that you're able to breathe better. What happens to the heart? Your heart pumps faster, right? Think about what happens when you're running. When you're running away from something, your heart is pumping fast. And then we'll talk about the digestive system. When you're running, your digestive system is not working. It's in lockdown. They're just All the food that you ate is just going to sit there. It's not going to digest. So when you're in a um, scary situation, your digestive system shuts down. Also, you're not going to want to feel like uh, going to the washroom, you um, will inhibit urination. You won't think about going pee. So if you ever had an urge to go pee, that is gone because the fight or flight kicks in. Okay, so that's what happens when you're running for your life. That's what happens to all your body parts. Let's look at the opposite, which is the parasympathetic system. And this is when you're relaxed. And when you're relaxed, what we say, you know how we said fight or flight for when you're scared? Or parasympathetic, when you're relaxed, we say rest or digest. So when you're resting or when your um, stomach is digesting food, and we'll talk about that. So let's see what happens to the body when you're resting. Your eyes are no longer dilated. Your eyes are no longer big. It's, you know, normal size or it's constricted. You might be going to sleep. So when you're sleeping, your pupils close, right? It constricts. Your saliva. When you're resting, you're, you would have sal um, salivary flow. Think about like when you're sleeping and then you wake up and you have jewels you know, going down your chin. That's because when you're resting, we get more and more saliva coming out of our mouth. And um, when, you're, when you get more and more saliva, it's because the glands are being stimulated. The salivary glands are being stimulated, and that's why you're getting a lot more saliva. Your lungs are constricted. 
So your lungs is not open. You don't need a lot of oxygen. So your lungs are more, the bronchos in the lungs are more closed up. And then the heart is slowed, right? Because when you're resting, you don't need your heart to be pumping so fast. It's relaxed. It's pumping slowly. So your heart rate slows down. When you're resting, you're also digesting. So when you're resting, think about when you eat like um, a huge meal and then all of a sudden you feel a strong urge to lay, lay down and take a nap. And what happens when you take a nap is your digestive system is working hard and it's kind of digesting all your food and take, you know making it travel through all the intestines and out. And then when you're resting or when you're in a comfortable level or a comfortable situation, that's when you may feel the urge to go urinate or you may feel the urge to go um, do number two as well. With the fight or flight, with the sympathetic, you don't feel like doing number one, nor do you feel like doing number two. With the parasympathetic, when you're resting or digesting, now you do feel like um, you know, going pee, or you do feel like going to do number two. So let's look at the anatomy of the um, autonomic nervous system. We talked about how there's two parts. There's, there's the uh, SANS, which is the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. And this is like when you're scared, fight or flight. And then we have the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system, which is depends, um, which is when you're resting, when you're relaxed. So when we're looking at how the nervous system works, the autonomic nervous system works, we're going to use this as an example. Let's say you see a glass of water in front of you and we want to use our hand to pick up that glass of water. So when we do it, it's like in a millis, we'll see that water and we'll immediately pick it up and drink the water. We'll immediately lift up our hand to our mouth and drink that water. But what's going behind the surface is that we're actually getting some sensory input. So what happens is when I see the water in front of me, um, a fiber or a signal basically gets sent to the brain and it tells the brain, hey, I want water. Then the brain sends a signal to the arm or to the hand and says, okay, use your hand and pick it up and drink it. So there's a huge process that's going behind the scenes when we see that glass of water that we want to drink. This process takes a fraction of a second. It takes very little time for this to happen. But there is something happening behind the scenes. The first signal goes through the afferent fiber, okay, the sensory fiber, the afferent fiber, where the body is telling the brain, I want water. Then the brain is processing the information and this area over here is called the central integrating areas where the brain is processing the information. Once the brain has processed it, the brain then sends a signal to the arm via the efferent fiber. Okay, And the efferent fiber allows you to lift up your arm and you know put it near your mouth to drink it. So again, there are different fibers that are um, working behind the scenes. So if you see a glass of water, the afferent fiber, that's the first um, fiber that sends a signal to the brain and tells the brain that I want water. And then the brain responds by sending a signal to the arm or the hand and telling the, arm, the hand to lift the glass up to your mouth. And that is made through the efferent fiber. So the way I remember what's first is A is alphabetically first. So that's the first fiber that goes through the brain. And then E is a little later on in the alphabet. So that's the second fiber that it goes through. So moving on, we were looking at the first fiber, which is the afferent fiber that sends the signal to the brain. And then it goes to the efferent fiber which is like the motor output, which is where the um, arm gets activated so that it can um, give you the drink. Now, when you look at the efferent fiber, if you zoom into the efferent fiber, it's actually broken down into two uh, sections, into two fibers. We have a preganglionic neuron and a 
postganglionic neuron. So just imagine that half of this is over here, the preganglionic neuron, and the other half of the um, fiber is the postganglionic neuron. And basically what's happening is the brain, okay, so this is the brain, sends the signal through the preganglionic neuron. So remember, this whole thing is part of the efferent fiber. So the first thing that happens is the brain, which is the central nervous system, CNS, sends the signal through the first half of the fiber, which is known as the preganglionic neuron. And then once it hits the end of this neuron, some neurotransmitters, which are these dots that you see over here. So these dots that you see over here are called neurotransmitters, and we'll learn more about that later on. They um, attach to this part over here. So they attach to the receptor over here, and then they send the signal to the arm to lift up. Okay, so again, when you look at this, when you zoom in this area over here, what's happening is the brain is sending a signal through the preganglionic neuron, okay, which is like basically the first half of the efferent fiber. And then when it gets to the middle, when it gets to the synapse, we call it, or the middle, there are neurotransmitters, which are those dots that you see that need to be released and attached to the receptor, attached to this thing over here, for the signal to keep going. If the neurotransmitters do not get released, if those dots do not get released, the signal will not go towards the arm and you won't be able to lift up your arm. So the neurotransmitters have to be released, those dots have to be released for you to lift up your arm and um, you know, bring the glass to your mouth so that you can drink the water. So the first half is the preganglionic neuron, the second half is the post, right? So pre is before the neurotransmitters, post is after the neurotransmitters. So postganglionic neuron is over here and then it sends a signal to the um, arm to drink. Um, a note to make is there's also neurotransmitters released over here. So again, dots are neurotransmitters which you get released and attached to a receptor um, over here so that the arm or hand can be used. So two neurotransmitters, one is over here and one is over here.